king of the ages, just in true your way. turn to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis 40. I was supposed to be in Sequoia National Park this morning. And uh, I chose the one national park to visit where there's, well, I don't know, there may be another one, but uh, this one happens to be on fire right now. So that's part of why I didn't go. And that fire started back like September the 9th, and I've been keeping an eye on that. So Supposed to be here this morning. We're back in the story of Joseph. I've been purposefully delaying this story, letting have, there be some distance in it because that's Joseph's life right now. Joseph's life is, Joseph has reason to be depressed because of what's happening to him. Very much like when someone goes through a tragedy, a funeral, crisis. Everyone reaches out at that moment, but then as time goes on, so to speak, we get involved in other things, but the people who have experienced that personally are still living it. 
And Joseph's still living it. I think it's been about five weeks since we've looked at him again. And here we are back. Joseph is the first prisoner in the Bible. Cain should have been. Cain killed his brother Abel. He was banished. But Joseph goes to prison for a crime he did not commit. And we're in Genesis 40. We're going to back up at Genesis 13 and look at a few verses there. Would you go with me in prayer to the Father right now? Abba Father, I ask that you teach us. We need to hear your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit lives in the lives of every believer. Your Holy Spirit draws all of us to yourself, whether we believe or not. And I pray we would hear your voice this morning, not the voice of a man. Teach us in this story. Show us where we are. Some of us are in prison right now. Depression is a prison without cell, without, without bars. Some of us are there. And that's real. Some of us are in jail cells of our own making. We need a deliverer and we have one. We need a redeemer and we have one. I just pray you teach us through this this morning. Get me out of your way. Help us hear you. In your name I pray. One of my favorite authors was Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson founded Prison Fellowship. And in his wonderful book, How Now Shall We Live? He opens the book telling about a visit he made to an infamous prison. It's now closed. You could actually take a tour through this jail if you wanted to. But it, it was an unforgettable visit to an infamous prison, the Garcia Marina Prison in Quito, Ecuador. One wing of that infamous prison had been turned over to prison fellowship and Dr. Jorge Crespo was in charge of that part of that special ministry there in Ecuador. And Colson writes, he says, as we entered the prison, as we elbowed our way into the entrance, he said, I smelled the stench of two huge mounds of garbage that were piled there by the doorway. It was overwhelming. He said, the uneven steps leading into the darkness were slippery in places. There was fresh splattered blood on the pavement before him. And Dr. Crespo said, somebody has been knocked in the head, beaten and dragged here recently. Blood was fresh. They passed from the sun-drenched street into the dim, narrow passageways in the first section of the prison known as the Detainees Pavilion. Crespo, Dr. Crespo pointed to several dark black cell-like holes in concrete walls. Those were the prison's notorious torture chambers. Described one of those chambers as a water tank where prisoners were kept in the water, placed in the water until their flesh sloughed off their bones, began to decay and slough off their bones. That's something, by the way, that happened to the prophet, of Jer prophet Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah. They put him in that cistern. They put him down in the well and left him there with the intention for him to die there. And that's a process. It takes a while. But where you're in water for so long that your, your flesh comes off your bones. As they moved along, Colson said, they seemed to be descending into darkness. They reached a series of cells that had prisoners. It says they were eerily illumined by narrow shafts of light penetrating downward from tiny orifices high on the mold-covered limestone walls. From the walls of each cell hung four bunks which were nothing more than iron slabs. Twelve inmates shared each cell, so the men had to sleep in shifts or stretch out on the floor thick with grime and spilled sewage. There was no plumbing and the air was fetid. Water was brought into the cell in buckets. When emptied, these same buckets were filled with waste and hauled back out. 
Colson says, I've been in over 400 prisons, so, excuse me, 600 prisons in 40 countries in my lifetime. I've never seen the horror of what I saw there in Ecuador. And he said, even more startling is this truth. The prisoners who were in the detainees pavilion had not been convicted of any crimes. They were still waiting to have their day in court. And some of them waited four to five years before that day ever arrived. Colson said they went further into the prison, down into the darkness, and it came upon a hallway where men were walking around, just staring off into space. That look of hopelessness that comes upon someone when they cannot find a way out. Finally, Dr. Crespo turned to Colson and said, hey, we're finally here. We're at cell block C. He couldn't wait for him to see the part of the prison that had been turned over to prison fellowship. Colson describes it this way. He says, a huge triple-tiered cell block appeared before them. At the far end of the corridor was what looked like an altar with a huge cross silhouetted against brightly painted concrete wall. Gathered in an open area before the altar were more than 200 inmates who rose out of their seats and started applauding. Some were playing guitar. All of them were glowing with joy and enthusiasm. And within seconds, Colson says they were surrounded by prisoners who would embrace them and hug them like long lost brothers. Colson was told that in Pavilion C, volunteers and inmate leaders provided rigorous instruction in Christian training and discipleship to the other inmates who were freshly brought in from some of these other horrible parts of the prison. Regular worship services were led by a variety of priests and ministers. Colson writes, he says, this was a holy community, a church like none I had ever seen before. <laughs> you might think it's odd to find a church in a calaboose, God's house in the Huskow. Although if you're in law enforcement, you probably wouldn't think it odd. I, when I was pastor of the church there in they, in Fort Davis, Texas, at one time I had three sheriffs in my congregation, in the congregation there, and uh, I guess they were closely watching me in that area. I don't know. We had three counties, and two of the three sheriffs from those counties were there, and, and one, of, one of the sheriffs, a dear friend of mine, but he referred to this type of thing right here as uh, jailhouse religion, where the inmates come in and they get right with God and go through an experience. And yet what is being described here by Colson is real, is genuine. He says that this was a church like I had never experienced before. And we, as we look into Joseph's story now, Bible prisoner number one, Joseph, we're about to see this man who had been falsely accused by his owner's wife, Potiphar's wife. That's what got him in the Egyptian jail, but he had also been betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. Joseph found himself in a place called the Cathedral of the Inner Cell. Some of you know that, know, know this place. You may be like, I've never identified it as that. You've lived here. You've spent some time here. The Cathedral of the Inner Cell. Going back to chapter 39, verse 20, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. If you go over to verse 15 of chapter 40, it describes it, Joseph saying, I've done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. So Joseph is not in a very pleasant place. Be careful that you don't sanitize this. It, it probably had more in common with the prison in Quito, Ecuador than our modern prisons. The concept, concept of innocent until proven guilty was as far into these people as pyramids on the Coosa River. <laughs> Joseph was tossed in the slammer, thrown in, and the key was thrown away. And this was his life now, and he had no expectation that, would, that it would be any different. Most likely the cell that Joseph lived in was just big enough for him to stretch out and sleep, scattering of straw there on the floor. He died sparingly on molded bread and stale water. 
It's interesting, sometimes another part of the Bible will cast light on the passage you're looking at, and the Psalms do that. Psalm 105, 17 and 18, it says, And God sent a man before them, Joseph, sent as a slave, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Genesis does not reveal those two little details right there. Till he became a trustee in that prison, he remained in his cell 24-7. No indoor plumbing, no two-hour Wreck time out in the yard, no party throwing warrant wardens, no prison bands of wailing, no jailhouse rock, just the cathedral of the inner cell. How can this be? How is it possible to build an altar in Alcatraz? How is it possible to build faith in Folsom? How is it possible to praise and sing sing? I tell you how. Back in chapter 39, verse 20, 21. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, last time we looked at Joseph, the fact was established that the Lord was with Joseph. And this is also reciprocal because Joseph was with the Lord. Joseph was trusting in God during this time. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph was with the Lord. And in his little five by eight hovel, because of these two facts working together, that five by eight hovel became the cathedral of the inner cell. And the first thing we discover about this special place, this unique sanctuary of worship is this. God is served there. God is served there. Verse 22, so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Because God was with Joseph, the warden saw something in Joseph, the way he went about doing his chores, the way he lived his life there. He took note of Joseph, and he put him in charge of all the other prisoners. Joseph's response to being in lockup was so remarkable. It got the warden's attention. Last verse of chapter 39, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Joseph was put in charge of the welfare of all the other inmates. He rose to the top. Judging by all the other occasions where Joseph rose to the top, Pyramid Penitentiary improved greatly. I imagine the evening gruel actually tasted like soup. A few more straws were added to everybody's mattress. Fresh Nile water was, was hauled in daily, and the infirmary was actually instructed and challenged to care for the patients for a change. Of course, all that's subject to speculation, but again, the Word of God tells us that every time Joseph was placed in charge of something, the Lord was with Joseph and gave success. Things got good, as good as he can be, in a prison. He served God as he was in prison. Chapter 40 begins this way, sometime later. We don't know how just, just how much time has passed in Joseph's life. I think he's now in his mid to late 20s. You, you really couldn't call him little Joe anymore. Young adult. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. They offended Pharaoh. The verb means to sin, to miss the mark. They sinned against Pharaoh. They did something to tick him off. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. I don't know, maybe the baker burnt the biscuits one time too many. 
And maybe the cupbearer who was there, his number one job was to taste the wine before Pharaoh did, lest somebody try to poison the wine and get rid of Pharaoh. Maybe he allowed Pharaoh to get hold of some tainted wine and, and it gave the old boy dysentery. I don't know, but something ticked Pharaoh off. And he threw these two men who worked for him, to, threw, threw them in prison. Same prison where Joseph was confined. Verse 4, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Little does Joseph know. Little does Joseph realize that God will use this assignment to bring his servant closer to his dream. Remember, way back at the start of this story, Joseph had dreams. Joseph had dreams that kind of insinuated that he was going to be important in his family and the rest of his family were going to look to him for guidance and help. Joseph's a step closer to his dream. He doesn't quite know this yet. That's the thing. When you're walking through your own story, you can't see what's about to take place. You don't put it all together until you look back at faith. Sometimes it's 2020. You're like, oh, well, I, I see that now. All Joseph knows at this moment is this. While he wiles his days away in the cathedral of the inner cell, he will look for opportunities to serve God. It's as if Joseph understood the words of Jesus before Jesus spoke them. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. In serving his fellow chain gang members, Joseph is serving God. So these two fellows are tossed into the prison and Joseph's put in charge of them. The latter part of verse five says, and after they had been in custody for some time, there it is again, some time. And we're not talking about a fast moving story here. After a while, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were being held in prison had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. These two guys have a dream. Next day, when Joseph came to them, he saw that they were dejected. I mean, come on, you're in prison. I don't know. I mean, Joseph's attitude is just such that he, it, it doesn't even enter his mind. You might actually be dejected because you're in prison. He saw that they were dejected, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him, why are your faces so sad today? What's going on? What's up, fellas? Why are you so downcast? He's performing his duties here. Now, if you had gone to the uh, manual of operations for how to run a prison, Joseph's task was just to serve, to take care of the other prisoners. Bring them their breakfast. Bring them their food. Do the normal prison things that need to be done. There's nothing in that manual that says you take care of their emotional needs as well or you take care of their spiritual needs. But yet in spite of the bars, in spite of the chains, in spite of the unpleasant conditions that constantly were <laughs> surrounded Joseph, that could have been used by him as an excuse not to serve God, Joseph served God. He served his Lord. I just want to pause right here and ask, what inner cell contains you today? What bars of circumstance do you use to excuse yourself right now from service to God? See, some jail bars are real, some are imaginary. Which are yours? I mean, what's the bars for you? Do you think, well, I'm just too old. Age has become a factor. I'm physically limited. I, I can't. I'm monetarily limited. I don't, I don't have what I need, so I'm just going to do nothing. I'm spiritual, spiritually immature. I don't know enough to be a witness. I'm perpetually busy. I just don't have time. I deserve the punishment of this cell I'm in. I mean, I'm a wretched sinner, and I'm not good enough to serve Jesus. Who is? I haven't met that person yet. <laughs> well, mine are extenuating circumstances. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. And he's excused me from service right now, okay? 
Is that your conclusion? Or is that God's? Regardless of who, regardless of where, regardless of how long, in the cathedral of the inner cell, God is going to be served regardless. Not only is God served in the cathedral of the inner cell, God is glorified there. After Joseph had asked the question, what's wrong with you guys? What's with the downcast look? They answered, we both had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them. If we'd had these dreams out there, we could go find an interpreter, hire an interpreter, tell him our dream, and we, we, we would know what was going on. But we'd had these dreams in prison. We've got no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, what do you think he's going to say? I mean, he could say, you had dreams? I'm a dreamer too. I was one time called the Lord of dreams. That's how much I dreamed. That's what you would expect him to say. But that's not what he says. You might think you say, well, tell me your dreams and I can interpret them for you. Again, that's not how Joseph started out. Instead, he uses this opportunity to glorify God. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? He's the one that can tell you what your dream means. Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. He gives God the credit before he even offers to hear their dreams. Good job, Joseph. He gives God the glory due only to his name before he exercises the gift given to him by God himself. As if to say, fellas, without God, I don't know a daydream from a nightmare. <laughs> With God's help, I can interpret your dreams. Tell me your dreams. It is easy to say to God be the glory. We just sang that this morning. It's easy to sing that, to say that when you have your freedom, your prosperity, your health, and your blessings. But when all those things have been taken away, stripped away, especially due to no contribution of your own, that becomes a hard thing to say and to mean. Yet Joseph was able to do so because he had allowed God to turn his cell into a cathedral because he had invited God to turn the cooler into a place of fervent worship. Glory to God. Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer said, well, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. Well, this is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. Joseph interprets the dreams, but notice right in the middle of his interpretation, notice again what he does. He says, but when all goes well with you, verse 14, but when all goes well with you, as I just prophesied and told you it would, as when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison, Okay. For I was forcibly, forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. Remember me. And again, he's glorifying God here. Know what he did not say. He did not say, if all goes well with you, if this goes like I, I just told you it would, he says, when all goes well with you. That, my friends, is faith in God. Faith that the gift that God has given you is from him and it's not of your own making. Faith that when God gives a dream, he always makes that dream of faith come true. And when that dream comes true, Joseph says, remember me. And although he has greatly grown in his faith here in the cathedral of the inner cell, he knows that God's future plans for him do not dictate that he live the rest of his life there. And he's thinking maybe the opportunity 
to minister to this one who has Pharaoh's ear might be what God uses to get me out. Well, that was a good interpretation. That had, boy, the, the, the chief cupbearer was like, yeah, that sounds good. I like the way you interpreted that dream. So when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable report, had given a favorable dream, he, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Well, this is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Hmm. That wasn't as encouraging as the other one. Verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. Happy birthday to him. And he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. Everything happened just as God had revealed it to Joseph. And the chapter closes with this verse. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Sometime, some more time, forgotten. And the next chapter tells us when two full years had passed. Two more years. That's how long it'll be before the cupbearer will remember Joseph. Wow. Don't you just imagine that when he had given that word to the cupbearer and when he said, when all goes well with you, don't you just imagine Joseph's hopes rose a little bit? I mean, hope, hope's a powerful thing. When you lose it, look out. Don't lose it. Pray and ask God to give you some more. We all need hope. I can imagine his hopes were up. He had served God. He had glorified God. Surely God would vindicate his servant at last. He was waiting I would have been. Yet as day turned into week, turned into month, turned into years, turned into two years, Joseph continued to find himself in the cathedral of the inner cell. For the next 24 months, he served God there. For the next 730 days, he glorified God there. For the next 17,520 hours, God was experienced there. A someone forgot Joseph in prison, but never once, not even for a single second, did the someone forget him. The someone. Someone may have forgotten you, but never for a moment has the someone, the ultimate someone, God, the creator of this universe, the creator of you, the one who loves you fiercely, never for a single moment has he misplaced you. Has he gone, oh, I forgot where he was. Wow, I need to do something about him, about her. Someone who really matters knew where Joseph was. The Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph was with the Lord. And I don't know, perhaps it was in Joseph's final two years of that time in the cathedral of the inner cell that Joseph experienced God the most. His relationship with God deepened to a whole new level. His ever-increasing awe in the presence and goodness of God made Joseph penitent before his creator and the lover of his soul. That little five-by-eight cell would forevermore be looked upon by Joseph as the grandest place in all of Egypt. I don't know. I just imagine as Joseph's story continues, 
We know eventually he gets out and is put in charge. I can imagine that he would return often to that little cell down below. Because we do things like that. We return in our memory or we return physically to the places of great victory or the places of great defeat. And I can imagine he, he went back again to that cell and he looked at it and he thought about all God had done for him. When God had his attention, because he was barred in, closed in. One of my favorite seminary professors, Dr. J.W. McGorman, I heard him tell the story many times when he was a young man, when he was in his early 20s, he had a disease. He spent two years in a New England hospital, two years. And he would tell about when he was back in the area, back near Nova Scotia, where he was originally from, he would go to that hospital and he would stand outside and look up at that room where he was held captive by his body by his medical condition for two years. And he would thank God. Dr. McGorman has been to the Cathedral of the Inner Cell. Chuck Colson, he received the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion in 1993. That's a $1 million prize. That's more, than you receive more from that prize than you would for a Nobel Prize. Colson served seven months in prison because of his part in Watergate. He was known as the Scandal's Hatchet Man. It was in prison that Chuck Colson found Jesus. His conversion led him to founding Prison Fellowship. And when Chuck Colson received that award in 1993, he said of this, he said of this, he said, out of tragedy and adversity come great blessings. I shudder to think of what I would have been if I had not gone to prison. I would say Chuck Colson has been to the cathedral of the inner cell. And I will submit, I submitted it 20 years ago when this message was first preached. I know it a little better now. Every person, well, at one time or another, find yourself in this inner cell. And your reaction through this time, as difficult as it may be, it will be a cell for you. It'll squeeze the life out of you. Or you can allow God to turn your cell into a cathedral where God is served, God is glorified, and God is experienced. Had a great joy this past spring to uh, there in Broken to, to teach the story of Job. Wow, what a story. And there was one particular incident, or there was many, but this one just got me. There, there's a verse in Job, and I'll end on this. It was actually spoken by one of Job's friends, a guy by the name of Elihu, a young man, angry young man, but he actually said something that, yeah, that's right. There in Job 36, verse 15, he said, But those who suffer, God delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. And this verse is what the one that got me. God is wooing you, Job, from the jaws of distress to a spacious place, free from restriction, to the comfort of your table laden with choice food. As I continue to meditate on that verse and look at it in the Hebrew language, I paraphrased it. Because that, that verse just spoke to me. It, it, it hit the two dominant themes in my life right now. And here's my paraphrase of that. God is wooing you from the knot that you are in. From the cell where you lie broken and paralyzed. There's no bars there, but you're paralyzed by fear, by life. God is wooing you from that knot. God is wooing you from that cell where you were broken and paralyzed into the wide open spaces of redemption's table. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Wherever you are this morning, you're walking in freedom, things are going good, or you are locked up on the inside. 
God's in all of those places. And the Lord is seeking you. You're here. You're hearing this now. You will be hearing this later. Seek the Lord while he, he may be found. He's stirring your heart now. That's him doing it. I don't have the capacity to do that. It's way above my pay grade. God's seeking you. God's calling you out. God's saying, hey, turn to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Will you respond to him today in his invitation? Let's pray. Father, you're a good God. This world is a hard place. At times, this world is a mean place. Just turn on our news and we can see that. We can recall incidences and moments in our lives where it seemed that. That seemed to be the reality because it was our momentary reality. But you're a good God. And you love us. And you're calling us. We may be in a situation just like Joseph where we're here through no fault of our own. And maybe we know the fault. Maybe we realize, well, this is my own doing. But the beauty of your grace, God, the beauty of your love is you, you, you call us in these places and your call is equal. In Romans 5, it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You love us. You love us dearly. You love us fiercely. There's nothing we can do to cause you, God, to give up on us. There's nothing we can do, God, to cause you to not love us. As you speak to our hearts this morning, may we respond in this moment right now where you want us to be, to, to respond in the way you want us to respond to your glory. I pray this in your name. Stand single 162.